Okay, so in this video, I just want to go over the what they call the alternating series theorem, which basically is just the statement that what we call alternating series um, always converge. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about absolute convergence and stuff because alternating series are sort of the, should be your sort of prototype of any series or, or they're sort of like the, the archetypal example of a series that can converge, can just con converge but not converge absolutely, which is what we call converging conditionally. So conditionally convergent series um, always have some mixture of positive and negative terms and alternating series are sort of like the, you know, a good example of that phenomenon. Uh, I'll talk more about that in a bit, but let me just, uh, so let me just state the alternating series theorem, which is just this statement that these series converge. So uh, if a one greater than or equal to a two greater than or equal to so on, this is a decreasing sequence of non-negative numbers uh, and the limit of a n equals zero. Remember that this, this, this requirement here does not guarantee that the limit will be zero, okay? This is like just going back to basics, but it's just good to remind yourself of the fact that like this, just having the sequence decrease does not guarantee that it'll actually approach zero. So uh, then uh, the alternating series sum of negative one to the n a n uh, converges always. So it's actually, it might be a little bit surprising that this is all that's necessary to force the alternating series to converge, but really it, it's true that just as long as you have a decreasing sequence of non-negative numbers, which are basically like the absolute values of the terms here, uh, and as long as those numbers actually approach zero, then the series is always going to converge no matter what. Um, and, you know, <clears throat> oh yeah, I guess they add in the book, in their statement here, they add um, Sn, which is the partial sum from k equals one to n of negative one to the k plus one ak um, satisfies uh, S minus Sn, absolute value is less than or equal to a n for all n, okay? So, um, of course, once you show that this converges, then that's what allows us to even make this statement because we have to show that S itself exists, obviously. Um, but it's not too hard to show that this, uh, that this series converges. So the proof here is just if you um, take this series and consider the even numbered partial sums and the odd numbered partial sums. So let, so this is, yeah, let uh, Sn be the partial sums. Uh, then uh, S2k is an increasing sequence, an increasing subsequence and s 2k plus 1 or 2k minus 1 sorry uh, 2k minus 1 yeah because we want this to start from 1 uh, s 2k minus 1 is a decreasing subsequence so the reason for this is because, right, to get, when you add one to K here, you're just going from S2K to S2K plus two, right? So it's just like, we're skipping, you know, every other partial sum. So we're adding two terms at a time, right? So um, S2K plus two equals S2K um, plus A um, 2K, plus one, right, minus a 2k plus two, right? 
And because the a's are decreasing, right, this one is less than or equal to this one. So this is greater than or equal to zero, right? And similarly, s2k plus one, right, which is what you get by adding two terms to this one, right? If you add one to k here, you go from 2k minus one to 2k plus one. So s2k plus one is s2k minus one uh, minus a2k plus a2k plus one, right? And this quantity here is less than or equal to zero because a2k is greater than or equal to a2k plus one, right? So, um, so that's why this one is increasing and this one is decreasing. And also what you can see is that, um, right, S2K is less than or equal to S2K plus one. So, so I'm gonna, oops, I'm going to erase this bit. So, and S2K is less than or equal to S2K plus one for all K, okay? Um, so actually, <laughs> you might start to recognize what's going on here because there was actually a problem on the midterm, uh, which is basically asking us to make the argument here that we're about to make. Uh, so if I were to define, like for example, okay, um, say T K is S two K and U K is S two K plus one. Okay. So we're, we're going from minus one to plus one. So we're kind of lopping off the first term here of the odd numbered ones, but it really doesn't matter. Um, so then we have TK is increasing. UK is decreasing. And um, TK is less than or equal to UK. Oops, K for all K. This is exactly, these are exactly the hypotheses of the problem from the midterm about an increasing sequence and a decreasing sequence, uh, which sort of run into each other or not necessarily run into each other, but like, yeah, they have, they satisfied this inequality uh, term by term, right? So like what we could say is TK is less than or equal to UK, less than or equal to U1 for all K. So um, TK is bounded above and hence converges, right? And then similarly, UK is bounded below. So it also converges, right? Uh, so, okay, I'm kind of running out of room. I'm gonna go back over this, but, but basically, yeah, TK is bounded above, UK is clearly bounded below by T1, for example, or any TK, T, TN or whatever, right? Um, so, they both converge, okay, so, you know, TK converges to some T, UK converges to some U, and I, I'm using different notation from the book, but I just think that this is a little bit more clean or something. Um, so now all we need is for T to equal U, right? Because as long as T equals U, then that means that like the even numbered ones and the odd numbered ones converge, the even numbered partial sums and the odd numbered partial sums converge to the same limit. So then if you were to take any subsequence of this sequence of partial sums, um, you know, or really if you took any partial sum, you can make the even numbered ones and the odd numbered ones both be close to the limiting value. And then if you take any one of these, it'll be an either even numbered or odd numbered. So it'll have to be close to the limiting value. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll get, I'll repeat that in a second, but yeah. So, so, um, so just, let's just show that T equals U. Then, um, you know, the, yeah, right. T minus U equals the limit. Oh, let's actually say U minus T, sorry. u minus t equals the limit of uk minus the limit of tk, which equals the limit 
of now if we replace uk with sk plus one and tk with s2k and then combine these we get s2k plus one minus s2k which is the limit of a2k plus one which is zero right because so yeah because the terms themselves converge to zero which was a necessary hypothesis right but because the terms converge to zero um, the differences of successive partial sums have to converge to zero so these two subsequences of the sequence of partial sums have to have the same limit. So u equals t, right? Uh, and now I'll finally <laughs> go to a new page here. So, um, so we know s2k converges to sum s and s2k plus one also converges to sum s, right? For sum s. So then, so then, you know, we're claiming that Sn converges to S as an entire sequence. Um, you know, if you really want to, you know, well, one way of saying this would be that any subsequence of Sn has to have um, basically either infinitely many terms. Well, basically, yeah. Uh, yeah, infinitely many terms from the evens or infinitely many terms from the odds. And uh, right, and if it's a convergent subsequence, then uh, whichever one of these two subsequences it has an infinite number of terms from, obviously it has to converge to the same limit as that, but that's just S, right? So any convergent subsequence has to converge to S, which means there's only one subsequential limit. So Sn converges to S, that's one way of seeing it. Or you could just say like, let epsilon be greater than zero, then, um, you know, take, uh, K1 such that uh, absolute value of S 2K minus S uh, is less than epsilon for all K greater than K1 and absolute value of S take uh, K2 such that um, absolute value of S 2K plus one minus S is less than epsilon for all K greater than K2 and then take N to be the maximum, oops, of, you know, whatever, uh, 2k1 and 2k2 plus 1 or something, then, sorry, this is capital N for n greater than capital N, either n equals 2k or n equals 2k plus 1 for some k. And then in this case, if n is 2k, then k has to be bigger than k1 because n was bigger than 2k1. And if uh, n was 2k plus one, then k has to be bigger than k2. So basically in either case, n is one of these, one of these two things is true, but that just means that s, um, so then, you know, sn minus s is less than epsilon in either case, right? So anyway, that, you know, so more than really needed to be said, honestly. But uh, so that should demonstrates that that finishes the proof of the alternating series uh, theorem. I want to just say a few words about um, convergence, conditional convergence and absolute convergence. So conditional versus absolute convergence, right? So obviously some alternating series converge absolutely. So some alternating series, e.g. negative one to the n over n squared converge absolutely. Okay, this converges absolutely because if you just put in absolute values here, you just get one over n squared, right? And we know that that converges so this series converges absolutely. Um, and, you know, so as a sort of a side note, I think I forgot to state this in a previous uh, video, but so side note. Um, if n converges absolutely, then a n converges in the original definitional sense, okay? 
it seems funny to have to say that because this phrase literally can includes the word converges, right? So it would be really weird if an could converge absolutely but not converge. But technically speaking, the way the definitions are set up, we, we have to actually, I mean, this is something that you would want to actually justify. And it is a corollary. This is a corollary of the comparison test. Okay. So I won't get too much into that because I don't want to get uh, bogged down here. But um, it's, it's just a, f a few lines. It's like one or two sentences. You can find it in the book. It's in section 14. Uh, but basically, yeah, so some alternating series converge absolutely. But some converge without converging absolutely, right? That's what we call conditional convergence. So some converge conditionally. So, um, for example, the sum of negative one to the n over n. That's sort of your archetypal example of a conditionally convergent sequence, or is con conditionally convergent series, sorry. So, um, what is different? Like, what's, why do we even make this distinction, right? What's actually interesting about absolute convergence versus conditional convergence? Well, here's the thing. So, conditionally convergent series actually behave sort of counterintuitively in the sense that like normally we're used to being able to take a sum of some numbers like some collection of numbers a finite collection of numbers we can add them up right and we can add them up in any order we want and nothing will change but and that's actually true for to for for um absolutely convergent series you can reorder the terms literally however you want to uh, and nothing will change. It'll still converge to the same number and everything. But actually with conditionally convergent series, some ways of reordering the terms um, will change the value of the series. So, uh, and when I, when I say reordering terms, I really mean like reordering an infinite number of terms at the same time, right? So if you just mess around with a few terms at the beginning of the series, obviously you're not gonna change the value that it converges to because after you get past all the terms that you reordered, if you only reordered a finite number, once you get past all of those, the sequence of partial sums is the same as it was before. So it, it'll clearly converge to the same thing. Uh, but so let me give you an example of how you can actually reorder terms to get a different value from a series like this. So um, here we can reorder terms to get a different value. Uh, for example, you could say, instead of just alternating like this, you could do like one uh, minus one, oh, let's say uh, plus one. One minus, uh, right, minus one half, and then minus one quarter plus one third. Uh, minus one sixth minus one eighth plus one fifth minus one tenth minus one twelfth plus one seventh minus and so on right you get the pattern so basically I've just taken the same exact same collection of terms right every term from the original series appears exactly once here but I just reordered an in infinite number of them so that there's always two negative terms after every uh, positive term. This converges. I don't even have to really think too hard about it. I mean, I don't know what value it converges to. And uh, proving that it converges to a different number is like, actually, it's not that hard because you can just look at the sequence of partial sums. And once it gets far enough away from the original limit of the original series, uh, then you, it becomes clear that they have to converge to different numbers. But uh, Anyway, so this uh, converges to a different number than the original alternating series we had. And actually, um, one thing that's very, might be sort of surprising, and uh, it's, it's actually not that hard to prove. It just takes a bit of like, you know, good notation and stuff and kind of thinking about it the right way. But I could actually prove it, you know, I'm not going to get into it now, but I could prove it for you guys um, that 
if you have a conditionally convergent series, so AKA a series which converges but does not converge absolutely, any conditionally convergent series can be reordered in a way to achieve any value you want for the sum. So like you can, you can describe a kind of an algorithm for taking a series like this and performing a, an infinite number of rearrange, rearrangements of the terms to get a new series that has the same terms as the original one in a different order. And that new series, you can do it in a way to, that will make it converge to any number you want for a conditionally convergent series. So conditionally convergent series are very sensitive to um, you know, exactly how they're laid out basically. Whereas absolutely convergent series, it just doesn't matter. You can just do whatever you want with absolutely convergent series. You can rearrange them. You can even separate the positive and negative terms into different sums if you want, and nothing bad will happen for absolutely convergent series. Um, so yeah, there, there's a pretty big difference here. Um, and I hope this kind of helps make that clear. Um, so with that, this brings me to the very last thing, which is a lecture question. about alternating series. So this is uh, lecture 10, um, question one, I believe. Uh, so suppose um, A1 greater than or equal to A2 greater than or equal to so on, greater than or equal to AN greater than or equal to zero, right? And um, so an is this decreasing non-negative sequence and the limit of an is zero and uh, bn is a sequence for which bn is greater than or equal to zero for all n and bn approaches zero and bn is less than or equal to an for all n. Does the series negative one to the n plus one bn converge? Okay. So of course the series of an negative one to the n eight plus one an we know that converges because an satisfies the hypotheses of the alternating series test or the alternating series theorem, right? Um, so we know that the series negative one to the n plus one a n converges by the alternating series theorem. So does this one converge? Take a few minutes, you know, write down your thoughts and include them with your homework. And um, when you unpause, I'll explain it. Okay, so the answer here is actually know that you cannot conclude just from these hypotheses that um, the series, the alternating series of BN converges. And a simple example of this would actually just be, um, say, AN is one over N. And so, no. Say AN is one over N and BN is like one over N for N is odd and zero for n is even. Then the series of bn just equals like one plus zero, or it's, I guess minus zero, I don't know, doesn't matter, plus one third minus zero plus one fifth minus zero, and so on, right? And hopefully it's not too hard to convince yourself that this series definitely diverges even though obviously the alternating series of AN does converge. Um, see, what happened here was that just requiring BN to be less than or equal to AN does not ensure that BN itself is a decreasing sequence, right? You can actually have BN experience these much more dramatic drops going from uh, you know, an odd number to an even number, and then it can increase a bit going from an even number to an odd number. So it can always kind of bias itself towards one or the other of the two types of numbers. So it can, it can cause the series to diverge just by kind of biasing itself towards the positive or the negative terms basically, right? Uh, so that the, the, the condition of being actually being a decreasing sequence here 
is like super important, right? It's like not nearly enough just to require them to be non-negative and like have zero as their limit, right? Like BN does have to approach zero from these hypotheses, right? Well, okay, actually, I, yeah, I guess I didn't even have to like say this just because if BN is greater than or equal to zero and BN is less than or equal to AN, then clearly BN has to approach zero. But uh, that's like not nearly enough basically, right? Um, it, it's, it's stronger that like there has to be kind of a balance between the positive and negative terms in the alternating series in order for it to converge. So anyway, that's, uh, that's all for lecture 10. Uh, thank you for watching and uh, we'll see you next week.